Hi, everybody. Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Identifying and Supporting At-Risk Students in Online Courses. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Uh, my name is Katie Savignon and I'm the Associate Director of Marketing at Learning House. And we're happy to be joined today by Galen Davis, our Director of Faculty Development and Video Production, and Danny McDonald, our Faculty, excuse me, Faculty Development Specialist. And before we get started today, I just want to address a few housekeeping items. So today's webinar presentation will last about 45 minutes and will be followed immediately by a 15-minute question and answer session. Throughout the webinar, I encourage you to type your questions and comments into the chat pane that can be found on the bottom right of your monitor. And be sure that to direct these questions to Learning House webinars. We will answer all questions um, at the end of the webinar session unless they need to be addressed throughout. Copies of today's PowerPoint slides as well as a recording of today's presentation will be sent to all attendees. Now I'm going to introduce our presenters. Galen Davis is the Director of Faculty Development and Video Production at the Learning House. Galen began his career in academic technology at Stanford University where he provided pedagogical support to faculty from a wide range of disciplines during his eight years there. Galen then worked for a small Pittsburgh-based Carnegie Mellon startup called ACOTAR, developing and teaching resources providing video production services to faculty producing online courses. He joined Learning House in 2015 as Director of Video Production and has since taken on the Directorship of Faculty Development. Danny McDonald is a Faculty Development Specialist at Learning House, where he trains college and university faculty on best practices of online course delivery. Danny has 16 years of experience in education, ranging from teaching high school math to college-level philosophy. Danny's teaching experience includes both face-to-face -face and online education. In addition to teaching, Danny also has experience in higher education administration, training, and course development. In addition to working at Learning House, Danny adjuncts for Boyce College and Boyce College Online. And with that, Danny, I will turn it over to you. All right, welcome everybody. Thank you for uh, being with us today. We look forward to discussing this very important topic. And the first thing that we will be discussing is how the online instructor can identify at-risk students. And before we do that, I would like to do a little online uh, poll. And I want you to answer this question. In your estimation, what characterizes an at-risk student? And uh, Galen is going to provide some instructions on how you can submit your answer into this online poll. Yeah, so the uh, the poll is about to load on screen, so you all should be seeing this the instruction to the top of the screen, uh, but you should be able to just uh, type in pollev.com slash Galen Davis 111, and you should be able to respond to the poll that way. If you prefer, you can also use your mobile device and uh, send a text message. You'd send it to the number 22333, and you'd first send the actual content would be Galen Davis 111. That joined you to the conversation. And then you can actually type your response. So I think it's easier to do with the, with the web browser if you have it. Um, so once people start responding, they'll start showing up on screen. Um, again, pollev.com slash galendavis111. And then uh, I think this will max out probably around uh, 25 just so we can keep the, the conversation moving. Um, so uh, yeah, looks like we're getting some responses. Great. Excellent. OK. Yeah, so whenever you hear at-risk student, what comes to mind? And some of the, what we're seeing here, one who's not engaged in the course, uh, I think what we see here, lack of communication, also in includes uh, not being engaged. These are some things that we'll be discussing throughout today's webinar. Low cumulative GPA is one. Yes, uh, students who enter college unprepared for the rigors of college work. That is definitely one uh, use of the term at risk. And in danger of dropping out or failing in the course, I'm going to tip my hand a little bit. That is what we're going to key on in this webinar. But much of what we see is uh, falls under the term at risk student. And uh, I think by now we're at a good point. I think every one of you have a good idea of what at risk is. So we're going to move on to uh, discuss 
identifying these at-risk students. And the first thing that we're going to do is discuss what do we know about online retention, uh, retention in the online course. Uh, one thing that we know is that retention in, is lower in online courses than in face-to-face -face courses. Uh, despite the growing number of enrollments in online education, I, Ching Tung, in 2012 surveyed various reports on retention in higher education. And these reports indicate that dropout rates tend to be 10 to 20 percent higher in online courses than in face-to-face -face courses. Some reports even indicate that online dropouts are as much as 20 to 30 percent more than face-to-face. -face. But regardless, uh, it is, it, the point is, is that retention is lower in online education. Uh, Patia Bawa in 2016 noted that online retention problems are not limited to any specific period or level of education, such as undergraduate or graduate. Rather, students are liable to withdraw at any given stage. So our focus is not just on undergrad students or graduate students, but students at large that are taking online courses. Uh, reasons for low online retention vary, ranging from unrealistic expectations on the part of the student uh, to the lack of faculty training for online teaching. So to address online retention problems, higher education administrators have been turning to the use of learning analytics to identify students at risk of withdrawing. And so our second point is that there has been an increased use of data to identify struggling students. It should be noted that the phrase learning analytics is ambiguous. In some settings, learning analytics refers to an institution's process of data mining information from uh, their learning management system, the student's enrollment process, and other university systems. Uh, this information has been used to direct, I'm sorry, to predict whether a student will struggle in their studies or not. And if a student is flagged by the system as at risk of potential failing or withdrawing, then uh, a university administrator or the instructor reaches out to the student. Uh, this use of data mining, though, is met with some resistance as opponents note that it raises ethical concerns. Uh, for instance, students may not be aware that the information they provide in their enrollment process is being used for other purposes than just information gathering for the enrollment process. Uh, the, the other way in which learning analytics is used is the feature of reporting of an LMS. Uh, this is a more narrow view that we are going to be using for this webinar. And uh, these reporting features within an LMS provide snapshots of a student standing within a particular course, uh, such as the grade, the frequency of access, uh, such as the days logged in, the number of features a student clicked, upon, clicked on or viewed, also, participation within the course, such as the student's discussion board activity, and time spent within the course. So, uh, so for retention, much use is being made of the LMS features, particularly the reporting features, to identify struggling students. And then the third thing that we know about retention is that a proactive approach on the part of the instructor can increase online retention. By utilizing these analytics in the LMS, the online instructor can take a more proactive approach to reaching students at risk of failing or withdrawing. The reports that are available indicate that uh, more, the more a student is accessing the course, viewing material, and participating in the course materials, the more likely they will successfully complete that course. And further, the more positive faculty-student interaction occurs within the course, and the more students take advantage of resources that promote academic success, then the more retention is positively influenced. So instructors then play a very significant role in the retention efforts of the institution, particularly in the online setting. But now what I want to do is to discuss in more detail what do we mean by the at-risk as we saw in our polls, we had some excellent discussion on what is meant 
what characterizes at risk. And so for the purpose of this webinar, I want to narrow our focus down. Uh, as, uh, if you were to do a survey of literature in the education field, the term at risk is used to refer to various kinds of students, many of which were listed in our poll, such as students with learning disabilities, students who come from difficult socioeconomic situations, to students on academic probation. Uh, the at-risk student addressed in this webinar, though, is the student who is at risk of poor academic performance. So uh, the students who are at risk of poor performance is the one who is like missing more than one assignment, or who logs on infrequently, or whose participation within the class lacks substance and quality. Uh, this at-risk student's performance within the course raises red flags such that their potential for successful completion is, is diminished to a degree. And also, uh, what we mean by at-risk students, these are students that are determined by the LMS analytics, what we have just discussed previously. Uh, and this information is within the online course itself, and is accessed only by the instructor. So here, the instructor and the institution avoids any ethical issues raised by the use of data mining, as we discussed earlier. And so the information is provided by their, the student's interaction or lack thereof within the course. So the at-risk student we're discussing is that whose academic performance is poor and that it is indicated by the information provided within the online course. So how can we use this analytic information in the, the online course? Uh, we're talking about learning management systems in general. We're not going to feature one in particular. But you find that they, all the learning management systems have a, a common thread that runs through them, and particularly in the reports that they offer. Uh, so. One such example of a report is the frequency of logging in. Uh, here, the instructor notes how many times during a preset period or during the course the student accesses the specific course. And so though uh, this feature right here is by itself not an indicator of the success, the frequency of logging in can indicate whether a student is putting forth the effort in the course. Another report uh, that's provided by the LMS is the time spent within the course. Usually this report is coupled with the frequency of logging in, and, but it also reports the amount of time a student spends in the course per login. Again, by itself, this indicator is not an indicator of success, but a student who spends an appropriate amount of time online, in this appropriate amount of time is relative to the course, then this student is more likely to be successful in the end. Another report uh, focused on the time spent on content and assignments. Uh, some LMS reports provide this information on individual assignments or components. And again, this is the time spent is relative to the course material. However, a student who accesses only a few course components or spends very little time on assignments has a greater risk of not completing the course successfully. Uh, other reports focus on the participation within the course, and in particular, within the discussion board. A student who is active in the discussion board tends to be a student who is engaged with the course content. Here, the online instructor should factor in not just the number of times a student has posted, but also they should factor in the quality of the student's participation within the discussion board, because frequent particip participation may not equate to quality participation. However, uh, this report of how often the student is posting uh, is a good clue as to whether the student is being actively engaged in the course or if they're just uh, popping in once in a while just so they can log in some time. Other reports focus on the student's grades 
And though the instructor can use the grade book to see a student's grade, some LMS provide a graph that provides a quick glance at the student's performance, giving a snapshot of their overall progress. And this allows the instructor to easily see whether a pattern is developed up to that point of the course, uh, a pattern that, if, if continued, may lead to failing or even withdrawing. And then some reports uh, also focus on missed assignments. And this is generally provided either as a list or as a graph indicating what assignments and assessments the student has not completed. And this is yet another quick snapshot where the instructor can quickly determine whether a student is on track within the course or if they're lagging behind. And so by leveraging the learning management system's analytics feature, the instructor can be more aware of their student's progress within the course and also quickly identify students who may become or are already at risk of failing and withdrawing. And then the instructor can be proactively reaching out to these at-risk students with the aim of helping them to get back on track. And so now I'm going to hand it off to Galen Davis, who will now speak to the student motivation and its relation to retention. Galen? Great. Great. Thanks, Danny. I uh, really appreciate that uh, the sort of back, background behind the retention issue. And, and I'm going to talk about motivation in just a second. I, I, I do want to give a, a sort of sense of perspective on the kinds of things that we're going to talk about and what I hope you should be able to walk away with. So with that in mind, I, I do feel like, you know, by the end of the session, that you should be able to describe the characteristics of an at-risk student, and certainly Danny's spoken to that a little bit already, uh, to be able to identify the components of motivation and how they relate to retention and engagement. Um, you should be able to uh, describe the importance of community building and the impact that it has on supporting at-risk students. You should be able to describe how designing for accessibility, and we're going to take a broad approach to the term accessibility, how that can promote retention, and also, we're, you know, in a general sense, we want you to walk away with some strategies that you can use in directly in your course, both with respect to course design and course delivery, to support at-risk students in your course. So let's begin with the student motivation piece, right? So students' motivation to succeed and persevere is absolutely vital in the success, in, to their success in your course. And essentially, it's the foundation on which essentially everything about their learning experience is going to be built. If your students aren't motivated to succeed, your efforts to do other things, like make sure you've got alignment between your course elements and your efforts to enhance engagement, build community, all that stuff's going to be for naught, right? So let's talk about what motivation means in an academic context and what you can do to foster it. So I can't dive too deep into this. I want to sort of give a high-level perspective on it. And in fact, I delivered a separate webinar on this topic last year on motivation and engagement, and you can dig that up on our learninghouse.com website. Um, but in general, research in the science of learning suggests that motivation can lead to goal-directed behaviors, and that these goal-directed behaviors, in turn, lead to positive learning outcomes, you know, learning and performance, right? But the, I guess the question for all of us is, well, what is motivation? What, what makes up motivation? Because I tell you, motivate your students, you know, that's sort of a meaningless statement. So the answer is that motivation is made up of two factors, value and expectancy. Value is what it sounds like, the sort of sense of worth that students attach to your course. And expectancy is the perception that students have that they're able to succeed. So, so let's, let's briefly talk about both. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll start with value, right? There are three different kinds of value when we're talking about motivation. The first is what we call attainment value. This comes from achieving greater levels of skill or competence, right? So uh, in the little infographic I've got on screen here, not infographic, little sort of graphic I have on screen, this is a piano player taking on greater challenges, right? So attainment value is all about getting better, getting faster, you know, tackling more difficult stuff, right? The next type of value is called intrinsic value, and you can probably guess that this comes from doing something that you just enjoy, right? It's about pleasure and, and joy and fulfillment. And for many of us, this could, this could mean a variety of things, right? Like, you know, playing music, cooking, uh, you know, writing a poem, and so on. And, uh, and chances are, I mean, I'm almost certain that everyone in this audience feels this way about their particular field of study, right? And Chances are you also want your students to feel this same sense of value that you feel. You want to get them to the same level. Uh, and lastly, there's instrumental value. This comes from doing something that helps you attain another goal, right? So 
in, again, in, in this graphic we have, uh, a pianist working hard with the goal of one day becoming a, a conductor, right? So in this sense, playing the piano has instrumental value if, to, towards his goal of becoming a conductor. Now, as you might imagine, it's challenging to foster intrinsic value. You know, it's, it, it's particular to everyone, to each individual, and it's based on a sort of deep sense of self, right? And similarly, in an academic setting, instrumental value can often be felt as a result of the course context, right, sort of its place within the curriculum. So if a course is a prereq for another course, for example, students are likely to feel a strong sense of instrumental value in that course that, you know, runs the risk of dwarfing any other sense of value. I got to do this to get to the thing, to the harder course or the, uh, the other course. This is all part of my requirements. I got to sort of check off as a box. And, you know, having talked to a lot of faculty about this, I, I, I feel that sense of fear that the only sense of value that students are going to have for their course is instrumental. But I do, I mean, it, it's, it's clear that if you reinforce the applicability of the skills and the knowledge that students are going to gain from your course to the real world, you make something real about it, you know, you can foster a more holistic sense, if you want, if you want to call it that, of instrumental value, that the course is instrumental to skills that they'll gain for the real world or skills that they gain in their, in their field of study or something like that. And, um, and also, attainment value can really arise organically from solid course design where you do things like, you know, provide meaningful and individualized feedback, you know, that's based on best practices, where you offer formative assessments, you know, that give students the opportunity to practice the skills you're trying to get them to learn um, in low-stakes environments. Um, and you, you know, where you scale the difficulty of the course, you know, as students scaffold their skills and knowledge. So there's sort of a recognition that they're doing more and more challenging things with hopefully just as much or greater ease, ease right? So then expectancy. So there, when it comes to this perception that you're able to succeed, right, there are two different kinds. Uh, and the, the, the first one is called outcome expectancy. This is the belief that a specific action or set of actions, for that matter, will lead to a specific outcome. So in this example here, the belief that jogging is going to lead to weight loss, right, the positive outcome expectancy. Um, if we apply this to an academic context, we could say that, you know, a positive outcome expectancy is that if you work hard and you do what you're supposed to do, that leads that you, you'll be successful, right? And the behaviors that are involved in academic success, I think we can all agree that, you know, if you do things like attend class and complete the homework assignments and ask questions and join study groups and attend the office hours and you know, that, that kind of stuff, that's going to lead to success. But imagine for a second that a student had some sort of reason to believe that these kinds of behaviors were not associated with success. Like there was, you know, a steep grading curve or something, or, or, or maybe you're known as an easy grader or you give out tons of extra credit assignments, which kind of undercuts the value of any of the other assessments that you offer. If, if they have a sort of negative expectancy about the course, negative outcome expectancy, the students are going to be less motivated to engage in these academic behaviors, right? So in some ways, you could label outcome expectancy as kind of an evaluation of the fairness of the learning environment. Are the cards stacked against you, you know, or is it fair? And the other kind of expectancy is what we call efficacy expectancy. And this is essentially the belief that someone's capable of identifying and organizing and initiating a particular course of action, right? So it's a belief in your own agency and capability. Because ultimately, it's, it's, it's obviously not enough to know that, you know, if you do all those things, attend class and so on, that you, that you can be successful. You have to believe that you're actually capable of being successful, right? You have to look in the mirror or be able to look in the mirror and say, I'm capable of doing this. I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me, right? So, so imagine a student has a positive outcome expectancy, right? They believe that if they do the work and all that kind of stuff, they work hard, they could be successful. Ultimately, to be fully motivated, that student has to believe that she has the capability to just to actually do the work, right? She has to have the pre prereq knowledge, she has to be able to access the materials, right, so, uh, you know, good bandwidth or decent computer and that kind of stuff. And maybe most importantly when it comes to retention, she has to know that she has sufficient time to complete the work. So if a student has a negative expectancy in any of these areas, her motivation is going to be compromised, right? So there are a number of things that you can do to help students identify value and thus help promote motivation. So what are some of these things? Well, one thing you can do is try to connect your material to the things that students value. Right. So to do that, you obviously need, you don't need to know what that is. So 
one good way to do that is to have an icebreaker discussion board or some sort of introductory activity where you ask students to introduce themselves and share a little bit about themselves, like, you know, where they're located and why they're taking the course and what their hobbies are and, you know, maybe something fun, like what's the funniest thing that happened to you this week? You know, something like an icebreaker, right? And the answers to these kind of questions can give you, you know, pretty valuable information about your students while also serving the goal of building community, right, which we'll talk about a little bit later. The other thing you can do to connect the material to what students value is to bring in current events. Um, so students, like, you know, most human beings care about what's going on in the world right now. So if there's a current event or, you know, a news article, a website, a blog post, something about, you know, something that's going on in the real world that relates to your course content, bring that in, and it helps apply what the students are learning to something in the real world, you know. And with, in a sort of similar vein, you want to be able to assign authentic, real-world tasks whenever possible as your assessments, right? And this is called authentic assessment. You want to engage students in work that's ultimately relevant to the real world in some way. And this can come in a number of different forms, like, you know, service learning projects or, you know, designing a database for a local nonprofit or writing a real grant proposal, you know, something like that. These kinds of real-world tasks can really provide a rich context for students that, can serve to engage and motivate them. And like I said, tie the material to real world problem solving. And you're also gonna encourage soft skill development in the, in the process. And again, like, like the other stuff, we'll talk about this a little bit more later. Um, and uh, you know, another benefit, a potential benefit anyway, is that it could lead to you know, internship opportunities or even employment, right? So this is, again, depending on the opportunity you're providing for students. And you know, students definitely benefit from hearing from experts. So you know, if you can't, consider a lot of examples of authentic assessment in your course, see if there's a colleague that you have in, in your know, friend or something like that in industry that could maybe help provide you feedback on an assignment for the students. So you might call that authentic feedback, right? Again, students benefit from hearing how experts think in the field, right? So try to think about what work professionals in your field do and see if you can leverage any of that to your students' advantage. Lastly, it's important to show your enthusiasm for the course and you know the material, right? So don't underestimate the power that that has to motivate students when you seem motivated yourself. So <laughs> it may sound silly, but try to remember what inspires you and excites you about your field of study. Maybe it's hard to do when you got this mountain of grading to do and you're getting all these accommodation requests and you're getting emails at 11 p.m. about something that's due at 11.59, but you, know, you can do this in a number of different ways, right? You can do this through module introductions, uh, whether these are filmed or written um, that where you talk about your, you know, you just, you don't even have to talk about your enthusiasm. It's not an explicit thing. You just show the enthusiasm. Um, and um, ultimately in the feedback that you provide to your students. Uh, and, you know, there are a lot of best practices that come to providing feedback, but you want to encourage students, you know, while also offering constructive criticism. And this is all in the service of, learn, of developing the skills that they need to succeed in your course. So the bottom line here is don't be afraid to show your excitement and happiness and all that kind of stuff. That's, that's a contagious thing, right? That students, students feed off that energy, right? When it comes to fostering expectancy, there are actually a number of different ways that you can do this. So the first thing that you want to do, and this, I know this is a high-level principle here, but you want to build positive but also realistic expectations for success. <laughs> now, I imagine some of you in the audience have had the experience of being in a course where, you know, in, in, in the first class, the professor makes this announcement where he's like, look to your left, look to your right, one of you is going to fail this course, right? And, and, you know, you can see that the spirit behind this is admirable. You know, you, the professor's trying to inspire students to work hard by acknowledging the course's difficulty. But ultimately, that kind of attitude really serves to undermine expectancy. It sort of suggests that regardless of effort, there's kind of a failure quota, right? So focus instead on underscoring that hard work and attendance and those other kind of academic behaviors are going to lead to success, right? And ensure that you reiterate your office hours availability and make available any support, you know, remedial or otherwise. Make sure those resources are available to students so they know where to find them. Um, another thing you can do to create, you know, sort of realistic expectations is to keep the size of your modules relatively consistent. You know, particularly in online courses, students really need to know what to expect when it comes to their workload. So do what you can to keep that workload consistent. And, um, you know, while we're talking about calibrating expectations, you want to be able, you want to ensure to students for online courses that, that they know it's, this is not, an, this is not going to be an easy course. So many online students sort of have the incorrect idea that online education is easier, 
you know, or that it's easier to get by, right? They, they kind of assume it's going to be like face-to-face -face education minus the in-person meetings, so less work overall or less time spent. So, but that's not the case, right? You're making up for a lot of that lack of face time with students with material, right? So it's important that at the outset, students understand what the workload's going to be and what you expect of them, right? A, a lot of students will gripe about discussion board posts, saying it's a lot of work, right? But the discussion boards are an essential tool, something I'll mention later, but they do require effort, but they're almost like a text for the course. You also want to target an appropriate level of challenge. Now, I know this is the Goldilocks sort of piece of advice here that's very vague, but ultimately, if the course is too hard, you know, students are going to disengage. If it's too easy, it's going to undermine the sense of value, right? Like, it's too, I'm not getting anything out of this. And figuring out how to scale the difficulty gets easier, you know, every time you iterate your course. So spend some time looking at the data after your course is done, the, the, e, the evals, uh, assessment scores, discussion board engagement, you know, where it fluctuates. And ultimately, and I highly recommend this, the, the scores in your rubric criteria, the individual criteria within your rubric, that's an extremely valuable piece of data where you can pinpoint specific skills where students are struggling and figure out where you need to punch up your course a little bit and where, you know, students, you know, because if things get too difficult for students and they don't have the resources available, that's a contributor to attrition, essentially. Um, Obviously, this is a difficult thing to coach on because the difficulty of your course is going to be dependent on a million different factors and the students themselves, obviously. Um, but uh, prior knowledge assessments can help here, too. And I'll talk about those a little bit later, too. Uh, you want to create early opportunities for success in your course, too, to, to foster expectancy. Um, you know, you, again, you want to scale the difficulty and create a real, you know, realistic expectations. But, you know, especially for at-risk students, this early opportunity for success can build confidence and thus efficacy expectancy, right? So consider providing some sort of formative assessment, you know, in the first week that offers students the opportunity to demonstrate their strengths. You got to make sure students are aware of help resources. I mentioned this earlier, you know, but this could be a for, for a variety of purposes, not just specific to your course. So, you know, the Writing Center, tutors, um, you know, OERs, like the Khan, Khan Academy videos or something like that that might help in relation to your topic. Um, also, you want to make, like I said, you want to make clear what your office hours are and make repeated encouragements for them to attend. You know, to be able to be able to uh, to, to be able to speak to you directly on this, on their confusion and frustrations and stuff like that is is important. It's essential that you are clear in your goals and expectations in your course. This is a high-level course design principle that I mention in just about every single workshop and webinar that I deliver. Your students need to know what the desired outcomes are, and you need to make it clear what you expect from them to achieve those outcomes, right? This clarity that you provide is going to do a number of things, but mostly it's going to provide, or it's going to build positive outcome expectancy by making this connection between the course of action that students need to take and the desired outcome. So a number of different ways to do this, have a netiquette policy for how students, you know, the, the decorum standards for discussion forums so students feel safe to participate, um, create rubrics for all appropriate assessments, um, you know, at least your summative assessments, if not more. Uh, there's a great article on the Center for Teaching and Learning site, by the way, www.learninghouse.com slash CTL on the topic of rubrics, the advantages of rubrics. I think, actually, I think it's called the benefits of rubrics. But the chief benefit when we're talking about retention of rubrics is that they make your expectations crystal clear. They familiarize students with the highest levels of achievement, so they know what they need to do. It's very clear. And by using that rubric, even with minimal comments or feedback, you're already indicating to students where they were weak and where they need to improve. So it's already kind of embodying best practices and feedback. Another way to be clear is to develop a course map and share it with your students. Now, developing a course map is a great step in the instructional design process before you build your course. It forces you to scaffold skills and knowledge and ensure that your objectives and your assessments and, and instruction are in alignment. And um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a great, it's, it's essentially a big table, you know, where you map all that stuff out and show the alignment between them. Um, and lastly, um, with respect to being clear, context is king. You need to provide context for everything in your course. Our mantra here at Learning House for faculty is review, preview, and motivate. So review, connect the learning, you know, what they're learning now to what they've learned before, their prior knowledge. Preview, give them a sense of what they should look out for in this particular piece of instructional material. And motivate, tell them why they should care about it or how it's related to the real world, why, why it's important. And it's important to have this level of context at any level on, of the course, from the course level down to the module, down to the individual course components. 
you know, essentially research on students who are given specific instructions on what to look out for in assigned readings, for example, they scored a lot better on their assessments and they retained a lot more knowledge. So the, whatever you can do to contextualize everything that students are doing in your course, the better. And uh, you can leverage your LMS's features to, to, to do that. Students need to know why they're doing stuff. Help them make the connection. Um, and lastly, offer students some sort of opportunity to reflect on their progress in the course. Um, this gives them a valuable metacognitive perspective on their own learning process, and it gives them an opportunity outside of the end of course evaluation to provide you feedback on the course's difficulty at various points and, and their preparedness for it, right? So one method, having a discussion board after a challenging assignment where students talk about what was, what was challenging, or just have regular journaling assignments. Now, I want to talk about engagement for a second because motivation is often discussed interchangeably with engagement, but they're, they're separate entities. So when we talk about how to encourage engagement, we're really talking about one of three things or all three of these things. And they're all about interaction. Students' interaction with the instructional materials or content, students' interaction with other students, and the students' interaction with you, the instructor. And when you work to enhance any of these areas of interaction, you know, ultimately you'll you're enhancing engagement, right? But any student's level of engagement is directly related to how motivated they are, right? So I, like I said, motivation is kind of the foundation, and this varies for everyone. And the bottom line is that designing a course with the goal of motivating and engaging students is going to have, is, is one of the most significant contributing factors associated with retention and overall success along with having an active and engaged instructor. So, for example, when you provide effective feedback, right, you're enhancing the level of engagement with the student. And if you're going to be following that by an opportunity for goal-directed practice, since feedback isn't useful unless you offer students an opportunity to actually, you know, implement what you recommend, you're going to increase their engagement with the material as well. So when you work to enhance your students' interaction with each other and, you know, you and the content through a number of different ways, your students are going to benefit from enhanced motivation, increased sense of value, and the perception of a sort of deep learning community, right? Now, I want to talk briefly about presence again, because engagement and presence are also linked to each other. Presence, as you might imagine, the perception that there are sort of actual people involved in the course, and it's not just like a correspondence course with a bunch of pieces of content to consume. <clears throat> and you can enhance it in a number of different ways. And there are three different types of presence. The first is social presence, where students, um, you know, sort of get to know each other. And this is, this is what gives life to the course and gives students the impression that there's other people who have the same sort of set of goals as students. Um, and it happens between the students and you and the students and each other. Um, and there are a number of different examples here of, uh, of activities that you can do to foster this sort of, this, this kind of presence. Um, there's also teaching presence. This is the degree to which, you know, you shape your students' learning experiences. Um, and this happens between you and the students and the students and each other. Again, um, there's a number of different ways that you can do this. Um, I put a star next to lecture videos just because you got to do those right. You know, it's easy to let those get out of hand. You know, if you're doing all of all lecture, that's not a good use of the, of the, of the medium, essentially. Um, and uh, the last type of presence is called cognitive presence. It's also called content presence. And it's the degree to which students build their own knowledge base, right? And this is a student thing, so between that, each other and the content. And, you know, there are a number of different ways that, uh, that you can do this. So, again, the reason I want to discuss presence and engagement in detail as we're discussing, you know, this pr problem of retention is because you have an inherent disadvantage as an online instructor, you know, compared to face-to-face. -face. This is built into the face-to-face -face experience, these, these sorts of senses of presence. They occur more organically, and you have to actively work towards this, you know, in, in your online course. So, Speaking of, let's, let's talk about community, building community for a little bit. I, you know, as many of you know, online education can be isolating, right? And when it comes to online versus face-to-face, -face, like I said, these are built in in face-to-face, -face, generally speaking, and you have to work at it in online. Um, so what do we mean by the word community? So I, I'd like to hear from you guys as to what the word community means to you. So again, it's the same poll. If you have the tab still open, I think that the content should have just, you know, repopulated. Um, you know, polyv.com slash Galen Davis 111 is the website. Uh, if you can respond briefly with one to three words, we should see an interesting, uh, I, I hope it'll be an interesting cloud that shows up. So, but I'd just like to hear from you as to what the, what the word community means to you. 
Great. Thank you for participating. So accountability goals, speech connectedness, yep, these are all great. People, active, yep, accountability, cooperating, yep, which are wonderful. Location, seeing a lot of great responses here. Thank you, everybody. The values, yep, these are all parts of the uh, sort of common understanding of what community means to all of us. Great. Okay, this is great, this is great. And engagement, I'm saying connection, common are the sort of biggest biggest words that we got in the, in the responses here. Okay. Membership, yeah, so this is great. I'm seeing a lot of the definition in this. So um, I'm gonna move on because chances are some of you are, are cut out anyway. Um, so research into community building suggests that it has five key characteristics. First is a sense of shared purpose, uh, the establishment of boundaries defining who's a member and who's not, establishment and enforcement of rules and policies regarding the behavior within the community, uh, interaction among the members, and lastly, a level of trust and respect and support um, among those members of the community. So we got a basic definition of community, but what are the main components of an online learning community? Right? Now here, as you might imagine, I'm gonna heavily condense from the research literature. Um, the first is uh, historicity. This is about acknowledging the diversity of skill sets and backgrounds and experiences that your students bring to the course. You wanna celebrate that and try to bring in that diversity of background into, the, into the, the classroom whenever you can. Identity, creating an atmosphere where your course goals are clear and the students have a sense of collective responsibility in achieving them. You can do this through team building exercises and logos even for your group projects, encouraging some sort of sense of identity. Mutuality, where you know, students have opportunities to work together. Um, plurality, where, you know, you, you encourage students to bring their real world experiences based in employment and membership or even just age, you know, into things and allow students to leverage their experience and share it with others and create networking opportunities. Um, autonomy, so obviously group identity is very important in building a community, but each individual's identity within that community is important. So provide opportunities for students to achieve your objectives by leveraging those strengths. Um, participation, you know, you want to discourage lurking and spectating and, you know, allow the diversity of experience to sort of shape the direction of your course. Uh, future, making the, the narrative arc of your course clear and keeping everything else clear, your expectations and so on. Technology, don't use technology for technology's sake, obviously. Use tools that integrate well into your LMS and that are familiar to students. Uh, learning. So you want to encourage individual expression, but keep things pretty focused on, you know, your objectives. So intervening in discussion boards. And uh, lastly, integration. So provide the basic, you know, pr or rather pr practice the basics of effective course design by ensuring alignment and so on, which makes, you know, the collective purpose much clearer. So obviously this is, this is a lot to work with. And these are all high level principles to keep in mind as you identify your objectives and your assessments and your instructional materials. But these sorts of behaviors, if you can enact this in a, at a high level throughout your course, you're gonna build that sense of community that creates kind of social glue among all the students and can help allowing some of those at-risk students to pull towards the margins, right? You can keep them a little bit closer to the center of the, of the class. Now, there are a lot of activities you have at your disposal to build community, but it's not really an end in and of itself. You know, it's not, probably not a goal you have. But, they, but you know, learning communities obviously do benefit students in their educational experiences. They can enrich ideas. Um, they can, you know, this sort of knowledge exchange between students can lead to a deeper understanding of concept, uh, concepts. So this intellectual exchange between individuals of really diverse backgrounds, which is, you know, like I said, endemic to online education, can lead to a stickier understanding of concepts, right? So um, improved communication skills occur. It's kind of a soft skill, um, but, you know, Students are rehearsing their communication skills, particularly if you have uh, group projects going on. And, uh, you know, like, like I said earlier, you can increase motivation, you can foster intrinsic value just from the pleasure of intellectual interaction with others. Again, overcoming the isolation of online education and, you know, enhancing the collective responsibility that students have to, you know, enhance the outcome expectancy of, uh, of students' motivation. And lastly, uh, uh, developing an awareness of the individual's responsibility in the success of the whole group. Right now, building community has a number of 
side effects that can help at-risk students, right? It's, I, I mentioned that psychological glue earlier, creating those social relationships, a support structure, right? And it helps to develop that sense of value, a shared purpose akin or even identical to face-to-face -face education. It doesn't have to be students with butts in seats in classrooms having a shared sense of purpose. You can, you can create that, you can engender that online. Now, I do briefly want to mention discussion forums. Some people love them, some people hate them. Um, you know, this is our, our engagement diagram from earlier. The best thing about discussion forums is that they hit all three areas of engagement. They offer students the opportunity to engage deeply with the instructional materials, with each other, and to, you know, and for you to engage, engage the students and facilitate and guide discussion, right? But what's also compelling about discussion forums is that they also allow for all three types of presence, right? Like social presence through, you know, certainly more by the informal icebreaker stuff, but also just in the interactions that can occur. Teaching presence, you know, as students contribute their thoughts and as you facilitate and guide that discussion. And cognitive presence as you encourage students to think deeply about the content, right? So don't underestimate the power of discussion forums as a tool to build community and help get all the students involved and ensure that students aren't being left by the wayside, right? They're a key tool in online asynchronous courses. They engage students, build community, and create social interaction, right? Now, I do want to talk about Designing for accessibility, I know we're running a little bit into our question and answer session here, so I'm going to try to move quickly through this, not that I, <laughs> not that I have been moving quickly already. But, um, but I do want to talk about accessibility. Now, the word accessibility, when it's mentioned in academic context, often inspires thinking about students with disabilities, right? But when you're designing for accessibility, leveraging this framework, the Universal Design for Learning framework, it's really about reaching as many students as possible where they want or need to be. So, this framework is, you know, encourages this kind of thinking, and leveraging it can help ensure that students who are on the margins of your course, for whatever reason, be it disability or learning preference or time management or whatever, get the flexibility they need to succeed while also effectively accomplishing your learning objectives, right? Now, UDL is often considered in terms of accessibility, right? So, and it's important to note that it's similar in terms of ensuring that content's presented in a way that can be, you know, perceived by the student, but there are some specific differences. First of all, accessibility is generally associated with an adherence to the law, um, specifically to ADA. And for that reason, accessibility tends to focus more specifically on the needs of disabled students. UDL, on the other hand, is different. UDL is an instructional design framework that focuses on the construction of a flexible learning environment. And it focuses on the needs of the disabled, sure, but it also focuses on the learning differences um, and the needs of all students. Um, briefly, the foundation of UDL lies in neuroscience, and it says that there are three regions or networks within the brain. The first is the recognition network, which is about recognizing content. The second is the strategic network, which is about developing strategies to work with content that's repeatedly encountered. And the last is uh, the effective network, which is uh, about caring and prioritizing and motivating, right? This is where arguably value and expectancy reside, right? That's just sort of the background on UDL. When you're designing for your course, one of the principal things that comes out of UDL is that it's essential to understand that there is no such thing as an average student. The average student is a myth, right? There isn't a single student in any class that's like any other student in the same class, right? And if we look at learning preferences as you know, sort of a scale or a sliding scale, that line in the middle, that average line that we see in the middle, no student lines up along that. So the idea, you know, most classroom designs are based on the idea, unfortunately, that, that the course should meet the needs of the, of the students in the middle, right, these students, but that student doesn't exist. And that, you know, and, and also that anything beyond this, you know, designing for either end of this is considered an accommodation, right? And instead, you know, teachers need to plan for the idea that there's gonna be differences in learning between students. You need to focus design decisions on the needs of those at the margins because when you do, also tend to meet the needs of those between the margin, right? So it's obviously difficult to understand the learning preferences for every single one of your students, right? And another way to think about this spectrum metaphor is to think about it uh, with respect to your instructional materials on an accessibility spectrum. On one end, you have stuff that's completely accessible, and the other end, completely inaccessible, at least to some students, right? And the spectrum, I should say, it shouldn't just be about disability, but about preference. Well, how, you know, how, how students prefer to consume material based on their learning styles and their circumstances, right? Because there's a student who in a coffee shop who might prefer to read a document rather than watch a video, right? Because you'd have a hard time watching that video in a coffee shop. So 
it's important to note, and you know, this may be obvious, that each of these spectra is individual to a student. So the accessibility of these materials here is, you know, individual to Colonel Mustard on screen here, you know. So, and here you're facing the same problem, right? Like how do you select instructional materials to maximize their reach and meet as many students as possible where they want to be? Well, the short answer, and a good, and a good answer I should say, is to add choice, right? So the more options that you provide to students, equivalent options for content consumption, the more students have the opportunity to customize their learning path based on their strengths and preferences, right? So if you have a reading, maybe next time you iterate the course, go back and add a video, particularly if, if that was a challenging concept for students. And students have a choice. They could read or watch the video or do both if they're struggling, right? So the UDL framework is a bit overwhelming. There's something like 39 instructional design guidelines. So I'm going to boil it down to the best recommendations as they relate to retention, right? It's essential to scaffold skills and knowledge in your course. We mentioned this earlier, you know, developing a course map is essential. Um, there's a video on the Center for Teaching and Learning site about course mapping and some templates that you can download. Um, you can offer a prior knowledge assessment. Again, we talked about this earlier. This is a tool that will help you gauge bias and misunderstanding and preparedness and you, both at an individual level and as well as for all the students. It can help you adjust things on the fly as if, you know, if, if you can. And again, same mantra, review, preview, motivate, establish context, take time to point out the links between what they've already learned and what they're going to learn later. And add options for instructional material in your course. This is a lot of work, I'm, I'm not gonna lie, right? If you've created a reading to create a video separately, that's a lot of work. So that's why this, we recommend you do this every time you iterate the course. So add that extra video. So it's gonna give you, you know, once you've taught it once or twice, you'll have a more solid understanding of the pain points in the course where it makes sense to target your efforts first. Also be flexible in your assignments and rubrics, right? So focus on the skills that you're assessing rather than the medium it needs to be in, right? So unless it's absolutely necessary they write a paper or something like that, avoid using language that's specific to that type of deliverable. So avoid using the verb write, for example, if, if, if a paper is not essential. Can the students submit a video instead of a paper? You know, that might speak to their strengths. You know, they might be able to make, a, you know, extremely effective arguments through different media. Um, it's also important to set standards of decorum, right? This is about creating a safe space for students, like I said earlier, you know, to have netiquette. Um, some of you may have heard of Godwin's Law. Um, and Godwin, you know, Mike Godwin was the Director of Innovation Policy and General Counsel of R Street Institute. And the Godwin's Law is, as an online discussion grows longer, the probability of a comparison involving Hitler approaches one. Now, yeah, this is probably more about anonymous sort of Reddit type stuff, but, you know, it's important for students to feel like they are, they can contribute without being ridiculed, you know, or something like that. Um, and, you know, lastly, you want to teach goal setting. This is arguably one of the greatest challenges that online students have when it comes to retention is time management. They're balanced, many of them are balancing family obligations, work, and so on. Avoid, try to avoid anyway, telling them the exact method that they should use to set goals because everyone has their own, you know, way of doing that. But point out the types of goals that you feel are most appropriate and try to give them an idea of how much time they should expect to spend on each task or each assessment that you're, you know, providing to them. Online students, like I said, they benefit from knowing how much time they're going to spend on certain topics. And it's good, especially if you're going to have a spike in work, you know, for a particular module that the students are aware of it coming up, right? And the soft skill of time management is key to success in online ed, I mean, and in life, right, in general, the workforce. Now, like I suggested earlier, designing with UDL in mind, that is designing for the margins, being flexible, that's a way to prevent disability-related accessibility issues before they arise. That's a way to circumvent it entirely. But there is, worth, there is one skill I wanted to mention worth mentioning specifically, and I saw someone mention it in one of the polls earlier, and it kind of brings together our discussions of motivation and accessibility, self-advocacy, right? Now, what is it? In the context of accessibility, I'm quoting from the source at the bottom, an act that a person with a disability engages in to demand support. Students need to understand their disability, but also understand their rights when it comes to requesting accommodations. And in 2014, the National Center for Learning Disorders reported that only 24% of students with learning disabilities reported them to their institution. And this is face-to-face -face education. Now imagine, for many younger students with disability, this is a big challenge for students. Their entire lives, they've had their parents and administrators sort of advocating on their behalf. Now they hit 18 or they're at college or whatever, and they're suddenly, boom, an adult, and they're independent, and they're supposed to be, then they're expected to be responsible for this. 
And the NCLD also stated in their research that there's a strong likelihood that this lack of disclosure of disability probably had a strong negative impact on retention and college completion. So independent of self-advocacy, this is understandable. You know, these kinds of disabilities, you know, when they try to deal with them with administrators and so on, it can humiliate people, it can discourage them and demotivate them. They face scorn and frustration and distrust and, you know, mountains of paperwork are necessary. And, you know, and when they talk to you about it, they, they, they know that in many cases it's going to add work for you and they're worried it's going to negatively affect your perception of them. So you're asking them to do more work. Um, and, you know, my wife was involved in a, uh, in a class action lawsuit about this. I, I, I don't have time to get into it right now. But what she learned essentially, um, and that's supported by the literature, is that generally the higher the education level, the higher you get in education, the harder it is to get accommodations. And this is particularly true with learning disabilities, you know, that aren't visible, right? That there, and there's kind of an assumption that this is a K through 12 issue and that, you know, hey, you've gotten this far, it's time to face reality. You know, you're not gonna get accommodations in real life, you know, in the real world, quote unquote. So, but the skill of self-advocacy is absolutely key for student, for these students, as well as all students, to be able to articulate what they need and to be able to persevere, right? That resilience. So this is a part of a broader discussion about soft skills, you know, skills that are tangential to, of course, as learning objectives, but prepare students to be effective members of society and the workforce and stuff like that. And we don't have time to delve into the topic, but needless to say, self-advocacy is definitely a soft skill that is you know, unlikely to be a learning objective for your course. But there are still some things that you can do to help encourage and foster the skill. You wanna encourage a growth mindset rather than a fixed mindset. And this comes from, as many of you know, Carol Dweck's research on mindset. So growth mindset is about believing that skill improvement comes with practice and hard work, whereas a fixed mindset believes that skills are innate, right? You're sort of born with what you got. And when, they, when people fail, they're very frustrated and they give up, right? Like, I'm not smart enough or this is unfair, right? It is often talked about in the, con in the sort of context of child rearing. So praise your child's hard work, not their intelligence or skill. The parent of a five and a two-year-old, I'm trying to deal with this all the time. And the specific tips in terms of growth mindset and teaching growth mindset are really those that overlap with this foster expectancy stuff, right? So for, if you do these kind of behaviors, students are gonna understand what's expected of them. They're gonna have a metacognitive perspective on their progress. They're gonna see the environment as supportive. You're gonna underscore the value of hard work as a means of success. And, you, and, and essentially you're creating and maintaining throughout your course, not just the beginning, but throughout the course, an environment of ongoing support and awareness. So the bottom line is that students need to have positive expectancy, a belief in their ability to succeed, to effectively build the skill of self-advocacy, right? Another thing you should be is aware of your student's disability resources, right? So, you know, you, you, you need to be able to know where to point people if necessary. Um, and you don't need to make a big thing of it, but it's, you, you, it's probably worth mentioning at the beginning of your course that requests for accommodations should be done up front. And you can include this in a welcome message or you know, an introductory video for your first module or a, you know, a, a, a forum post, whatever you want. But this will, in, a, in essence, indicate your sensitivity to disability, but also underscore that there's a process and requests can't be last minute, right? You're not gonna, just gonna deal with it at 11.58, you know, before the one minute before the assignment's due, right? And lastly, treat accommodation requests fairly. I know that you know, when you got this heavy workload and things are, you know, you're stressed out, it can be easy to look at a request for accommodation from a student as, the, you know, as a student kind of try to take advantage of you or get an edge over their classmates. So that's what I'm saying, leverage your on-campus resources to ensure the legitimacy of the request. Right? So I know I've kind of rushed through a lot of stuff. I, we wanted to separate the takeaways into those that focus on course design and those that focus on course delivery. Uh, I'll focus on the course design ones. First of all, create a course map. I keep, I keep saying it, I know, but it's important. It, it has you break learning objectives down, um, forces you to chunk information, and helps ensure that the at-risk student's not gonna be overwhelmed. Um, you should include a prior knowledge assessment. Make this a standard practice in all your courses. You may spot areas of weakness with one, some, or all students. And regardless of the result, you're probably gonna learn valuable information that will help you make adjustments and even throw up red flags and can help you identify potential at-risk students. Um, you want to include an icebreaker activity. You know, you want to get to know those students and what motivates them. Um, and this, it's a great community building exercise. And the at-risk students in particular benefit from overcoming that isolation. 
Um, you want to design and use rubrics because they, they make your expectations clear. And uh, it's extremely discouraging to get a bad grade because you didn't understand what you were supposed to do, and rubrics help prevent that. And I know they're time consuming to design, but it's worth the effort because in many ways you're trading design time for grading time, right? It can make grading easier. And you can focus that extra time that you're given during the grading period to focus on students who struggle, right? Um, lastly, use the uh, course enhancement period, you know, when you complete your course and you're preparing to teach it again, to add options for instructional materials, right? You want to add other types of instructional materials to your course um, to add, uh, you know, and to be able to, uh, you know, use the course data that you have to identify those trouble spots. Um, and lastly, add flexibility in your assessments and consider the verbs that you're using in your instructions and rubrics. And if you have, you know, creative submissions from the past, anonymize them and present them as examples. So model creative and effective submissions. And uh, for course delivery, we're going to turn to Danny, who's our vice president course delivery expert. Excellent. Thank you, Jalen. Uh, so for course delivery, uh, first thing you want to consider is to remind students of institutional resources that are available to them. Uh, sometimes students are not aware of uh, resources available to them. Other times, students need encouragement to utilize these resources. So point them to uh, uh, tutoring services, uh, the disabilities office, uh, anything uh, that may assist the student in being successful at their time at the university. Uh, another point to take away is uh, to use the course analytics feature as clues. Course analytics are not the end-all, be-all. And while these analytics give a snapshot of where the student stands in the course, they do not give the context behind the information presented. Uh, that is, it does not tell you why the student is missing uh, assignments or why their grades have taken a dip. So use them, use them as clues, but in order to know the context, you want to do uh, the next point, contact these students personally. You can use the LMS message feature, uh, personal email, and if appropriate, even a phone call. But uh, with this information in mind, don't just assume there's something going on. Uh, Tailor your message that invites the student to share with you if there's anything going on that's leading to what you see in the course analytics uh, features. And uh, make yourself open to the student, willing to work with them. Uh, the next point is that you want to practice consistent and effective instructor uh, presence. Uh, reports indicate that students are more likely to be actively involved in the course if they see their instruction in the course. Post weekly announcements, reply to student discussion board threads, and post available office hours within the course. Instructor presence within the course speaks volumes to students. Uh, you also want to build substantive and meaningful community, as Galen shared with us. Students are more likely to thrive when they sense that they belong to something, and this is no less true in an online course. So by building substantive and meaningful community within the course, the instructor creates a safe atmosphere where the student experiences a sense of connection with their instructor and also their classmates, and also uh, have a safe place to interact within the course material. And then finally, you want to foster a growth mindset and self-advocacy. Uh, by, by creating a course atmosphere where students are encouraged to face challenges and to grow in knowledge and experience. Further, you want to foster and maintain this atmosphere where students feel free to raise concerns with the instructor, uh, concerns related to learning disabilities or the questions regarding course material or other uh, issues that may arise related to their progress in the course. And so those are the takeaways for the course delivery. And uh, as we wrap up, I'm going to hand it back off to Galen. Yeah, and uh, and again, I'm sorry that we went over, um, and you could sort of hear me going at a bit of a breakneck pace, try to get through so much because there's so much that we want to impart to you guys, and I didn't want to, you know, eliminate too much. But uh, but we'll be talking a little bit more about this at uh, at Connect, which is Learning House's annual conference coming up in June, uh, June 27th and 28th. It's going to be in Louisville, and it's our, the eighth one that we've held so far, and uh, it's 
it gives us an opportunity to present some thoughts about, you know, from higher education thought leaders about it makes the latest innovations in higher ed. So you'll get, you know, in addition to what we talked about today, you'll get a chance to hear about, you know, competency, competency based education and things like digital credentials and alternative credentials, uh, enrolling to retain graduate students or, you know, and this, this kind of stuff. And if you're interested in uh, enrolling or you're coming to connect, you can go to learninghouse.com slash connect. And, um, you know, as a, and as a thank you for attending today's webinar, you'll get an email that should include a $200 discount code. Um, and you also get the slides from this event. So, you know, even though we went pretty fast through some of that material, you should be able to consult that if you found anything that was particularly, you know, attractive to you guys as an idea. And get, hopefully we got some of the creative juices flowing. So I know that we're five minutes over at this point, but if there are any questions that, that I can answer from the, from the pod or from the question pod, I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to. We are we more have than a happy to, I should say. Yeah, we have a couple of questions um, for you guys. So the first is, do you have any information about a, dif a difference in retention for online programs with versus without a synchronous chat as part of the course? That is a very good question. Um, Danny, did you come across that in some of the research that, that, that you did um, with respect to the staff on retention? Actually, uh, I did not. I have seen uh, various reports that seek to uh, determine the benefits of synchronous over asynchronous or vice versa. And the, and the, the reports are rather mixed. Uh, some students like the synchronous aspect. However, uh, I tend, do tend to find that most prefer the flexibility of online, which entails a more asynchronous approach um, because some students are not able to meet at the particular times that are offered, and most students take online because it, they can work it around their family and life schedules. But when it comes to retention in particular, uh, there's not a report that I've seen that links synchronous with uh, higher retention. So I would say uh, most reports tend to indicate that while there's really uh, no big difference between preferences, there, there is a students do tend to prefer, like the asynchronous aspect more. Yeah, and I, I did also want to follow up by saying that, um, you know, Katie mentioned that I worked for a startup uh, previously, and we did a lot of synchronous stuff. We did a lot of sessions in Adobe Connect, or, our, or rather our, our partners did. And, they, and it presented a lot of problems um, because as much as we want to believe that it's possible, I mean, you don't see us sharing our video right now. You know, and because, it, it, you know, bandwidth, technology competence is so variable when it comes to students, particularly online students who, you know, span the gamut in terms of technological capability and technological situation. You know, there could be someone in rural India, for all, all we know, with, you know, who's using a, essentially a modem speed. So there are so many technological hurdles that make it um, not the greatest option, and that's why we tend to discourage synchronous sessions in many ways as, a, as required sessions. So as optional sessions, office hours, they can work really well. Um, but generally speaking, yeah, it's, it's, it's a challenging thing nowadays, even with our current state of, of internet connectivity. Great, thank you guys. And then one other question, and uh, this may be more for our retention or market research side of the house, but wanted to see if you all had any thoughts. It says the online student population is made up to a large degree by adult learners. What do studies and literature identify as the leading causes of lower retention given the nature of the adult population? Well, I would say there's actually, uh, and I'm not saying there isn't research out there, but I did not come across anything about adult re learners. However, in other related uh, research, adult learners face a unique challenge as opposed to students, uh, I guess we can call them your more traditional, because adult learners uh, generally have a gap between the last time they attended school and when they're attending now. And so you have, uh, as you know, with any skill, uh, if there's a, a period of time when you're not using it, you get, you get rusty, so to speak, so you're having to relearn your skills. And then you have other responsibilities that come up that 
uh, that necessarily come before school. So uh, I, I obtained my PhD while I was uh, I worked full time and had two part time jobs on top of that, and raising a family uh, with my wife. We have three daughters, and I will tell you that there have been there were times when family had to come first, and so. Uh, whereas your more traditional students, um, they t while they do have responsibilities, they tend to be relative to ad adult learners uh, fewer in number or magnitude compared to uh, the adult learners. And then another thing I noticed is just that some, uh, some adult learners, uh, they may have not finished college in the past, uh, so they may have old habits of approaching academics that they're having to overcome, or uh, bad habits when it's when it's related to self-efficacy, uh, you know, um, changing attitudes and, and thought processes when it comes to their own ability to completing school. Now, that's not true for all adult learners, but that is a, especially in my experience when I've dealt with adult learners, these are people who have who had given up on school or did not. Uh, when it comes to college or do not attend college because they did not see it in their future because uh, they were not strong students in high school, but now they're having to attend school. So they're having to overcome old habits when it comes to self-talk, self-efficacy. So I think those matters do come into play. Great. Thank you, guys. Um, well, if that's all that everyone has, we'll wrap it up for today. And again, thank you everyone for joining. Um, and as they mentioned earlier, a copy of today's presentation as well as the recording will be sent out to you, um, if not today, then tomorrow. Thanks again.